Joseph Morissette was an Army veteran who lived in a small town in Michigan with his wife and son. During the winter, he was a trucker and a scrap iron collector. One day, Morissette was hunting for deer, and he found a large pile of spent bomb casings about six miles from any main highway. Based upon the rust and decomposition of the casings, uh, Morissette reasonably assumed that the casings had been abandoned. With no signage restricting the activity, Morissette decided to be an entrepreneur and collect and crush and sell the casings. Unbeknownst to Morissette, the land turned out to be on Oscata Air Base, which they routinely used to drop bombs, practice uh, artillery range. An officer saw the bomb-looking material in the back of the guy's car, obviously stopped the guy to see what was going on, explained his story, uh, went on his way. The officer um, actually sent him over to the FBI, who charged him with embezzling, stealing, purloining, or normally converting government property. The district court refused to hear this argument that he had innocent intentions and sentenced Morris set to two months in prison and a $200 fine. The Sixth Circuit agreed, saying that the intent is irrelevant unless the law states otherwise. In a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court overturned the two lower court's decisions, saying that the mere omission of any mention of intent from a statute cannot be screwed, construed as eliminating that intent. In the opinion, Chief Justice Robert Jackson provided the historical context of the importance of requiring a guilty state of mind. In that opinion, he said, the contention that an inquiry can amount to a crime only when inflicted by intention is no provincial or transient notion. It is as universal and persistent in mature systems of law as belief in freedom of the human will and a consequence ability and duty of the normal individual to choose between good and evil. This case opens the book we have named our panel after, Three Felonies a Day by Harvey Silvergate. Silvergate, a civil liberties attorney, opines that many active members of our society go throughout the day without ever knowing that they have committed several crimes. Mr. Silvergate's hypothesis seems likely given the uncountable list of federal criminal statutes and regulations. Literally, the feds tried to count all the criminal regulations and statutes that they have, and they gave up. Uh, there was just too many. Texas is not immune to an ever-increasing criminal statutory and regulatory scheme that can see someone being convicted of a felony for harvesting oysters at the wrong time of day. However, when a regulatory body, such as the EPA, decides to break their own rules, we're sorry. And that's about all that happens. Uh, today, we've assembled a very esteemed body of panelists from different walks of life to discuss this issue over criminalization. And without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist. Uh, to my right is uh, Representative Matt Kraus. Representative Kraus was born in Tyler, Texas, where his father was a youth pastor at Green Acres Baptist Church. He's a constitutional attorney, college professor of American and government, and a public speaker on America's founding fathers. He and his business partner also work with financial institutions, businesses, nonprofits, and churches on ways to creatively reward and retain key employees, and also putting in place transition plans for those institutions. Representative Krauss has completed his second term in the Texas State Legislature. He represents District 93 in Tarrant County, and his district includes parts of Fort Worth and Arlington. This session, Matt served on the Corrections and Land and Resource Management Committees. During his two sessions in the House of Representatives, Representative Krauss has been recognized for his stances on limited government, fiscal responsibility, traditional value, family values, and pro-life advocacy. He and his wife, Jeannie, reside in Fort Worth with their four children, Jeremiah, Hannah, Sue, James, and Gracie. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative Matt Krause. Well, good morning, or afternoon, I guess, now. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. As Greg said, my name is Matt Krause uh, from Tarrant County area. And uh, I'm really glad we're actually talking about this. Uh, criminal justice reform has not historically been a subject that a lot of conservatives have given a lot of thought to. I, I don't know why. It just seems like it's always kind of been a subject area that we've left over towards uh, the other side of the aisle or, or different ideological stripes. But uh, criminal justice reform is a very conservative idea. Because you think about it, we're, most of us are about limited government. And how can we have limited government if we're incarcerating so many people, which is taking them away from their families, which is not allowing them to provide for their families, which means somebody else has to provide for them, and nine times out of ten, that person is going to be the government. And so the more we incarcerate people, the more we grow the size of government, the more we not uh, take away uh, fathers and mothers from their families and un un not allow them to do the things they need to do. So uh, that really caught my attention. I remember it was at Texas Public Policy Foundation when I was first running as a candidate. Uh, they give you kind of a briefing school. You, you go through a lot of uh, subjects in one day, and one of the last ones of the day was criminal justice. And I thought, why, why are we even covering that? But the more we learned about that, the more we talked about that, the more important and clear it became to me of how critical this uh, issue is. 
And so coming into this last session, uh, my office and I wanted to see what we could do to hopefully help uh, aid in that uh, movement towards criminal justice reform because uh, the right has taken the lead on it, which has been great. We have Right on Crime. If you don't know about that uh, initiative, you ought to look that up. But Right on Crime has been a huge tool and a huge asset towards criminal justice reform. And it's great because it's a very bi bipartisan issue, actually. There's a lot of my colleagues on the Democratic side of things that agree with me on a lot of these issues. So we come together, we work on them. And so we were trying to figure out how we could add to that conversation, how we could help, and uh, worked with Vikrant uh, Reddy. I don't know if he's in here yet. Uh, he may be coming later. But he was with TPPF at the time. Now he's moved on uh, to the Koch Institute in Washington, D.C. to head up their criminal justice division. But uh, he started talking, and he said, Matt, did you know that we have 1,500 laws outside the penal code for which you could go to jail for? I said, how's that possible? Because, you know, in, any citizen to know what's right and what's wrong, you think, okay, I'll go to the penal code or I'll go to where they talk about what crimes are listed. And if we have 1,500 laws for which you could be jailed or incarcerated or fined for outside of the penal code, that doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence as a citizen that what I'm doing that I know I can do or that I cannot do. And so we started looking into it. And uh, anytime we have 11 different criminal penalties in regards to how you harvest oysters. Did you know if you dredge oysters at midnight, you could go to jail? And did you know that the pecan tree, God bless the pecan tree, pecan pie, you know, it, it's very well known around the state, but did you know if you do anything to dislodge pecans from the tree, it's a criminal violation? And the statute actually says by any means, including thrashing. You know what thrashing is? It's taking a stick and just waving it up there. So if you take a stick, waved it up in a pecan tree, pecans actually fell down, you are in violation of a criminal penalty. That's crazy to me. And so we thought, okay, how can we do this? And Vikrant got our attention very uh, quickly, he said, what can we do? And he said, well, there's other states. Look at Minnesota. What they had done is they created a commission during uh, one of their interims. They looked at all these laws that uh, were archaic, were duplicative, which were inefficient, which we didn't need. They got rid of 1,100 laws in one day uh, from a commission overseeing all these statutes. Other states have had that, Republican states, Democratic states, a lot of these states had had that. So we worked together with him on a bill this year that would create a commission that during our interim, from the time we uh, were at Sine Die on June 1st to the time we gavel in uh, the second Tuesday in June, or, or January of 2017, we've got a commission that was created that's going to look at all of those laws. And then they're going to come back with a recommendation to the legislature saying we should get rid of this, we should move that, we should do this, we should do that. And hopefully we're going to be able to take a uh, uh, measure uh, or some steps on the first couple of days of the session to get rid of 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, whatever it is, up to 1,500 laws that we no longer need or at least make sure that they're in the right place. And I think that is so important just for uh, the confidence of the citizenry to know that uh, what, they, what they can do and what they can't do is all contained in a single place. So that's one of the things I'm very excited about. Uh, we actually added that commission to a law that was uh, authored by Representative Workman. And what he was doing on criminal justice reform was uh, taking us back to the rule of lenity. And sometimes when there's a different interpretation in a court of law, the judge or jury can look at it one way, or they can look at it another way. What Texas did is said, we want to make sure that those statutes, those laws, those rulings are interpreted in the most lenient way possible so that if a person is on the cusp or right on the border of going to jail, not going to jail, being guilty, not guilty, we want to uh, be lenient and in their favor. Now, these aren't for hardened criminals. These aren't for aggravated assaults. These aren't uh, for any of your major crimes. But just in those areas where, you know, there's a little bit of, black, uh, a little bit of gray, it's not black and white, we're going to err on the side of not having people uh, go to jail. So. I think that's good. I think that's another great step. And then once we got it out of the House, uh, we found a great sponsor over in the Senate, uh, Connie Burton, and uh, some of her staff is here today. And she did a fantastic job with it because she added a lot of other criminal justice reforms to it. So by the time that bill got done, it had, what, six, seven uh, different aspects of criminal justice reform in it. And so uh, Senator Burton, Representative Workman, did a great job. I'm glad we got the commission out of that. I think it's going to go a long way uh, with what our aims are. And I love what criminal justice reform is doing. I uh, was a big fan of Doug and what he did. You'll hear a little bit more from him later. But just a man who was passionate about not seeing people be penalized for the rest of their life um, and just made huge 
strides to get things done. And I think you're seeing a lot of that with criminal justice reform, people coming together. Hey, let's not put people in jail that we're mad at, just the ones we're scared of, right? Uh, and let, let's make sure that there is a reason that we're putting them away. If we're mad at them, let's figure out another way to rehabilitate them, uh, to punish them, whatever we need to do. But let's not take them away from their families, take them away from their jobs, take them away from their communities, because that just breeds uh, 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 petri dish for big government. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention today. I look forward to talking with you a little bit more, but uh, enjoy the rest of the panel. God bless you guys. Thank you, Representative Krause. Next we have up Doug Deason. Doug has been the president of Deason Capital Services, LLC, the Deason family office since 2009. DCS manages family assets, including a large holding of Xerox Corporation shares, municipal bonds, a majority holding in Funimation Entertainment, and 1200 Media, a substantial holding in oil and gas operating company, Forland Resources LLC, and a large holding in the global tax services firm, Ryan LLC. DCS also has investments in PE funds, debt funds, oil and gas funds, and LPs, subprime auto loans, real estate, mezzanine loans, and other assets investments. Prior to joining the family office, Doug was CEO of Precept Buildings, Inc., a decent family-owned nationwide commercial builder from 1993 to 2009, and co-managing partner of Evergreen, Evergreen Realty Partners, a commercial and multifamily development company based in Dallas. He currently serves on the board of directors of 1200 Media Group, Forland Resources, Decent Capital Services, and Trexon Energy Partners, Ryan LLC, ID Life, and DCS Finance. Jeez, Doug. <laughs> no wonder you were late. Yeah. <laughs> he also serves on the advisory board of Valesco Industries, a Dallas-based private equity and debt fund, the executive board of the Bobby Lyle School of Engineering at Southern Methodist University, and is chairman of the advisory board of the Darwin Deason Institute for Cybersecurity at SMU. Doug has served on numerous boards of private and public companies, as well as several different charitable organizations and private schools. He has served on the finance committee of the Dallas County Republican Party for four years. He has also served on the executive committee and as membership chair for the West Texas chapter of the Young Presidents Organization. He graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1984 with a degree in data processing, quantitative analysis. Uh, and I had the uh, distinct pleasure to uh, work with him during this session on a lot of the criminal justice reform bills that uh, Representative Krauss uh, brought up. And uh, you know, Doug has been a very passionate individual about these, uh, these issues. So it's uh, my honor to uh, present to you Doug Deason. All right, thank you very much. I want to, uh, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm actually here representing our family foundation, not, not the business. I, we have no business interest in uh, criminal justice reform, as you can imagine. Um, a little bit about my story, uh, and it, I think there's a handout. Is that included? It's, everyone has one. Okay, yeah. okay, in the handout, there's a, uh, uh, a uh, op-ed that I did in the uh, New York Times in July. It kind of and it tells my story, but just just briefly to let you know, um, yeah, you know, we're we're very very politically active, and, and we are Republicans. Um, we were very involved in this last election cycle, and, and came out with some great relationships. Obviously, with the governor, with uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, I was his uh, chair of his campaign in uh, uh, North Texas and Dallas, at least. And, uh, you know, and a lot of the statewide elected officials and, and our local officials. So, so we were kind of, you know, thinking what, what could we do to, to help, help society and, and uh, you know, something I've always been passionate about and felt so lucky is I've never had to check that box. You know, the, the, have you, the one that asks, if, have you committed a, a crime or have you ever been convicted of a felony or, you know, it asks it in different ways. I've never had to check that box. And I'm so lucky that I didn't. If you and at some point read that uh, op-ed, so I won't go into it in, in depth. But when I was 17, uh, we had a party. A friend had given me the keys to his house. His parents were out of town, so we had a party. The neighbors called the police. They thought it was a burglary. They came in. Uh, you know, once they figured out what it was, they didn't. They, but they had guns drawn, all that. Once they figured out what was going on, they just said, "We're going to take you all in, or we're going to take the perpetrators." So I raised my hand since I had the key. I got taken in and charged with burglary, which was a felony. And uh, it, it quickly, luckily it was in Northwest Arkansas. My family's been there since 1840, so we know everybody and we're related to half of the rest. And um, we, we uh, were quickly negotiated a, a, a plea bargain deal where I got a, uh, had to pay a fine. I got a, a uh, 
six months probation. And I, it was tough, but for six months I kept my nose clean and stayed away from the beer and uh, got, actually had my record expunged at, at the end. And so I've never had to check that box. And every time I come to it, I've always thought, man, I'm so lucky I don't have to check that box. So I, th I always think about, because we've literally employed you know, hundreds of thousands of people through our different companies over the years, and we've always made it a point that, you know, obviously we ask the question, but we've always instructed our HR departments not to hold that against someone. Let's, let's give people a chance. And we've hired many felons who have been to prison and, and have made it out and, and reintegrated into society. And we still do that today. I mean, the, the guy that, that uh, manages, kind of manages our household for us, used to pick up my kids before they started driving at school, is a convicted felon who uh, spent eight months in prison for burglary. And he's, he's a wonderful man, a, a good heart. He just made a mistake. And, let, you know, people make mistakes. So anyhow, that's my story. That's my passion. Uh, that's why I'm here, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is... Uh, Oh, I do want to say one other thing. We, we've taken this to, to a new level, and we haven't officially announced this yet, but the Charles Koch Foundation and our family foundation uh, just jointly contributed $7 million, uh, a couple weeks ago to SMU, to the uh, Dedman Law School, to open a new criminal justice reform center. It's called the Decent Family Criminal Justice Reform Center. Thank you. And, you know, this is such a hot topic right now around the country, not just in Texas, obviously at the federal level, that we, instead of doing it as endowment, we've donated all the money as operating funds so they can get up and running. I mean, we're, we're right now we're just starting the search for the executive director. But the point is to get, you know, get, get going with it immediately while it's a hot topic. And, you know, our hope is, is that in five years we shut the center down. You know, we've, we will have accomplished so much that we can, you know, who knows, probably won't happen, but it's great wishful thinking. Um, so that's uh, something we're excited about, and obviously we'll be working very closely with TPPF on that. Now, what I'm here to talk about is uh, mens rea. What do I point this at? You need to turn it on on the side. I think you should have been, might have an auto. Flick that down. There we go. There you go. Thanks, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is, uh, uh, you know, mens rea. Mens rea, what does that mean? It means uh, uh, guilty mind. It's Latin for guilty mind. And, and, and basically what it refers to is, you know, what, what was the intent of someone who perpetrated uh, a crime or, a, you know, violated one of the 300,000 regulations that we have uh, today. In 1790, as you can see, there were 20 federal crimes today, and this is just the federal level. There are 5,000 criminal offenses and over 300,000 federal regulatory offenses. You know, that, that means Congress had nothing to do with those uh, rules and regulations. They were all done by unelected bureaucrats. Um, yeah, I don't like that. Uh, that doesn't make me happy or comfortable. It's estimated that uh, on average, each and every one of us commits three felonies a day and doesn't even realize it. Uh, here are a few examples of some of the laws. You can look at those, but you know, and you've already heard some of those. Just the, the oyster laws are so stupid. And that's Texas, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So these are federal, uh, you know, rolling something down the hill in a national park, what, whatever. Just there's so many silly laws, and we've all heard stories. And we hear them all the time about people who are arrested for, for dumb things. I think it was Bobby Unser who got lost. Was it Bobby? Yeah. Yeah. Bobby yeah. Unser got lost in a uh, uh, in a snowstorm on a on a snowmobile. Ended up in a park, national park, on accident. Right? It's a snowstorm. So when they rescue him, they also arrest him for driving a snowmobile in a national park. So. And he spent, and he, and he got convicted of a felony. It's absurd. Uh, you know, and, and so what we've talked about here is we need to have commissions at every level, at, at the uh, uh, municipal, the state, the federal, to go through and clean up all these laws and regulations. Uh, obviously, over crime, over crime and, and over regulation of business. Uh, you know, Dodd Frank, as we all know, was was. Uh, was supposed to clean up, help us get uh, our financial institutions back into uh, in order, get uh, banks 
all it did though obviously was add, wait, I'm too, one, one too many, there we go, uh, was add too many, you know, 2,300 pages and 400 new administrative rules. Um, and I, I can say, <clears throat> we, we finally closed, it took us over three years, we put a group together and bought a bank uh, about six months ago, a small community bank in Dallas. Um, after several tries, you know, we had to deal with every level of government to try and get it done. It took three years. We finally got it closed, and I've refused to sit on the board because even though we're the largest investor, our CEO has to, it's, you have to have monthly board meetings, and then you have separate committee meetings, sometimes several times a month uh, because of all the regulation. Um, it's just astounding how many regulations there are in the banking world today. And, and it's the small community banks who suffer. It's not the big banks. The big banks can afford it. Uh, since Dodd-Frank, um, checking, you know, it used to be free checking was the norm. Uh, in 2009, 80% of banks offered free checking. Today, it's 60%. And uh, fees have gone up. Over the last six years, they've gone up over 50%. So, luckily, Congress, at the federal level, Congress is actually doing something about it. Um, finally. And it's a, uh, uh, go to the next page. Oh, I didn't see that. The House uh, resolution is a bipartisan effort, and uh, it's actually a, a mens rea uh, bill that, that will, you know, you'll have to have a cause. The be, burden will be on the government to prove that there was criminal intent. And it's, it's, uh, it passed the, out of committee, uh, what, I think 21 to zero or 20 to zero. So it was unanimous. So that, that has a great chance of passing the House. In the Senate, there it is. In the Senate, though, there's a mens rea reform act as well that was introduced a few days later. Uh, this has, this one, uh, has a, I think it's passed out of committee. Uh, the great thing about it is uh, Senator Ted Cruz, our next president of the United States, is uh, the, um, one of the sponsors. So that's, that's uh, great that they're finally working on this. This is something that people have been asking them to do for a very long time. You know, the, the big kickback that they get, President Obama is, is one of the people who's opposed to uh, any reform, mens rea reform is that uh, it, it's the wealthy CEOs and the wealthy investors who are gonna, going to uh, uh, benefit. And, and it's not true, and I, I'm here to tell you right now, it's not true, because the, the wealthy investors and the wealthy CEOs, they have the teams that, that can uh, keep them aware of what the laws are. You don't get run afoul of the laws if you've got a great uh, team of attorneys going through it all you know, watching everything you do. And we've literally spent tens of millions of dollars in legal fees over the last 20 years trying to avoid just these types of situations. And you can't. And so then you end up spending millions more defending the company. But it's always the company, you know. And uh, turn to the next page. Oh, there's... Mine's a little different than yours. I don't have that, yeah. Where'd the, I guess the reality is the false. Yeah, the reality, okay. So, so I, I kind of covered that, but the BP Gulf spill is a perfect example with, you know, no one's gonna go to prison on that. They're, they're, there's hundreds of millions of dollars, or billions of dollars, I'm sorry, billions and billions of dollars that they'll pay in fines, but that's it. So it's a, it's a small business people who get hurt by these laws. So, uh, you know, there are guys like Kristen Everson, and, and I urge you to Google him and see what you uh, learn his story. There's a great YouTube video put out by the Heritage Foundation, but, you know, read through and see his story of just a perfect example of someone who, good guy, and spent almost two years in prison for a ridiculous, you know, uh, accusation of, of uh, that, that was, didn't harm anybody. So in summary, I'd, just, uh, I'd like to say many states have passed mens rea laws, including Texas, although ours certainly needs to be expanded. 
Congress is finally following suit, although President Obama opposes this bill. As discussed earlier, you know, his excuse is that wealthy CEOs will get the uh, get off scot-free scot from white-collar offenses. And of course, as discussed earlier, uh, it's the small business people who get hurt the worst by the lack of mens rea laws. I think we need to require agencies, law enforcement officials, and prosecutors to use common sense and stop bullying our innocent citizens. We need to put the burden on the government to prove if someone acted with bad intent merely or merely made a mistake. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Next, we have uh, Shannon Edmonds. Mr. Edmonds is the Director of Governmental Relations for the Texas District and County Attorneys Association, the largest statewide association of prosecutors in the nation. Mr. Edmonds serves as a liaison between prosecutors and the Texas legislature on criminal justice, juvenile justice, and governmental representation issues. Upon conclusion of each legislative session, he authors TDCAA's popular legislative update book, a comprehensive analysis of legislative changes that affect the Texas criminal justice system. Between legislative sessions, Mr. Edmonds provides training, education, and assistance to members of TDCAA and other legal and law enforcement entities. He has also written articles and given presentations on the legislative process and a variety of other legal topics, including capital punishment, prosecutorial ethics, DWI law, child abuse, gambling, and mental health issues. Mr. Edmonds has a degree from the University of Texas and the University of Texas School of Law. He was a prosecutor in Travis County, Texas from 1993 to 2000. He then served as an assistant general counsel to Governor George W. Bush and as a policy advisor to Lieutenant Bill, Governor Bill Ratniff before joining. TDCAA in 2002, where he has worked for the past, oh, joining TDCA in 2002, where he has worked for the past seven legislative sessions. Mr. Edmonds lives in Austin with his wife, Megan Edmonds, PhD, and their four children. Ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Edmonds. Thank you, Greg, and uh, thanks to TPPF for uh, allowing me to come and be the turd in the punch bowl. Um, <clears throat> you're going to laugh. If you don't laugh, I've wasted like 10 minutes putting together this PowerPoint, so go ahead and laugh with me. Let me say, and you can tell, I'm going to have some fun with this by our title, right? Liars and, lions and tigers and felonies, oh my. Um, one of the things I need to just make clear is that I'm here in my personal capacity. I'm not speaking for my association or other prosecutors here. Um, and also that a, a lot of what has been talked about has been federal in nature. We ain't got no time for no federal stuff, all right? We don't care anything about that, frankly. I think it's a mess. Um, I think a lot of what's being done in Washington is to make their system more like the Texas system, and that's a good thing on things like mens rea and other things like that. But I'm going to talk about it at the end as sort of a neutral observer who's been in the system for 25 years, both in courts and at the legislature, and what I see going on in Washington in the new reform movements. Now, um, in my 10 minutes, I'm going to try to cover three different topics relatively quickly. Uh, fear, who cares, and this new criminal justice reform movement. All right. First, let's talk about fear. Now, you know I have no fear because I'm throwing up an FDR quote at a TPPF function, right? <laughs> so the point I want to make, though, is that we have an interesting topic, three felonies a day. How many, let me see by show of hands, how many here have read this book? All right. So maybe five or six. I didn't want to buy it, but I checked it out at the library and I skimmed it. Okay, and here's the uh, premise, basically, that the average professional commits several federal crimes every day. And when I read that book, though, I kept seeing these examples that this criminal defense lawyer had put in his book, and I was thinking, what's the average, what's average about this guy? They were all very unique circumstances. The one that I most identified with, with was the criminal defense lawyer who destroyed child pornography evidence on behalf of his clients and then was prosecuted for it. I don't really think that that is something that the rest of us need to worry about. And indeed, when I did a little more research, I found that the author of the, of the book actually is quoted as saying, uh, that's really just kind of a figure of speech. 
okay? Three felonies a day is bull. It is, but it's effective bull. He sold a lot of books. He has. So it works. But we see this a lot in, in all areas of politics, but especially in criminal justice, okay? And I know most of you here, I'm going to assume you're pretty conservative, and you should be skeptical, right? You're skeptical of the government. You're skeptical of the media. Use that skepticism when you hear some of the things put forth to you in criminal justice, all right? Here's one from 2007 from then-candidate Barack Obama saying that we have to do more work when more young black men languish in prison than attend colleges and universities. Isn't that why we should reform the criminal justice system? And by the way, Dr. Ben Carson just said something very similar this summer, okay? Eight years later. Guess what? It's horse hockey, okay? In fact, this is from a, a, a group on blackmenthink.com, okay, defending African Americans from this soft bigotry that more of them are in prison than are in college. And in fact, when you look at these numbers, not only is it reversed, but this is all black men of any age compared to the number of black men in college, which is a narrower cohort, right? Maybe 10 years at the most versus 60 years worth of folks who may be in prison. So in reality, it's more likely that for every black man in prison, there are six or seven or eight who are in college. But that doesn't get change. That doesn't get the attention of people you want to convince. Here's another one. I'm going to show you because it goes on both ends of the spectrum. Senator Cornyn is a great champion for victims of human trafficking. And we're proud that he has decided to take an interest in this topic because it's something that we really need to work on. But this statement is bull. It's just like that statement, remember that old trope that was going around saying that the busiest day for domestic violence is the Super Bowl also? And that eventually fell out of favor when people realized there was no support, no evidence for that. Now it's the biggest human trafficking day. Again, there's no support for this. When we had the Super Bowl at Jerry World a couple years ago, you know how many arrests they made for human trafficking related things? Three prostitution arrests, three. That's probably less than what happened on a normal day in Arlington, right? So you're not from Arlington, right? I am. Dang! That's my district. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good yeah, but the point is that people, this is well-intentioned, we want to get people's attention to this very serious problem, but when people don't pay attention to serious problems, human nature is to tend to kind of get a little farther out there on the branch and jump up and down until people start taking notice of you. Here's another one that just came back, and I see Mark here. Mark and I have been talking about this. The Center for American Progress came out with a new study that said almost half of U.S. children have a parent with a criminal record. And I went in and dug into that, and it is bull. They have no actual research behind this. In fact, TCJC just retweeted a study the other day, a show that said 7% of children have a parent in prison or who has been locked up before. 7%. This study said, pardon? That's because you're accurate, okay? But guess what? Nobody pays attention to that. That tweet got like one retweet, okay? But, th no, it wasn't. <laughs> but, but I can be bought, so. Okay, but, you know, they, they're well-intentioned. They want to help, right, do it for the children, okay? But it's a lie. And why do people do this? Why do they make these things up? It's because they know they're never going to get called on it. I have a real job. I can't run around pointing out everybody who's making us stuff up, okay? And it's effective. It works. That's why people do it. And we know that it works because we were country when country wasn't cool. When you talk about overcriminalization. At TDCAA, we have been trying for decades to convince legislators not to make everything a crime. Okay? And this is a document from 1993. I blew it up to show the things that we used to ask legislators to consider before they create a new crime. Back in the day before email, when I started working at the legislature, I would go and take that piece of paper and put it in every House mailbox and every Senate mailbox. And you know what? 
People pulled it out and they wanted it up after reading it and they threw it in the trash. And they started creating crimes, okay? And so we do have a lot of needless crimes in Texas. Here's my next question though. If you create a crime and nobody gets prosecuted for it, do we care? All right? This is the output from the Texas legislature since 2003. We were the first group to start keeping track of the new crimes that were created. And if you look, it starts with only 23, but remember that was the year that the House Democrats ran to Oklahoma. So they didn't pass any bills, much less new crimes. In reality, there are 200, this represents 284 new crimes in Texas since 2003. We average 47 per year. Now we are seeing a downturn the last two sessions. It'll be interesting to see whether or not that holds. One big piece of this puzzle was something supported by TPPF and folks on the left and prosecutors, which was to require legislators to be notified when they're about to vote on a bill that is going to create a new crime or increase a punishment. And whether or not that accounts for this downturn, I can't say, but it's hopeful, okay? So in Texas, our penal code was uh, drafted in 1993, went into effect in 1994, and we have increased it by about 60 crimes over the past 20 years. It comes out to about four per year that go into the penal code. That's it. Well, where do all the others go? It's what Representative Krauss alluded to. They go in the business and commerce code, the finance code, the occupations code. We have a book, Texas Crimes. There's the website. You can buy it for $20, okay? And it lists all of the crimes that we can find, all right? Now, they're not all jailable offenses. I will say that. Many of them are fine-only crimes, okay? And that's an important aspect to note about the savings that will or won't come from getting rid of them because we're not putting people, first of all, we're not prosecuting many of these. A lot of people don't even know they're on the books. So if we're not, we're not putting people in jail or prison. So by eliminating them, we're not necessarily going to save prison bed or jail bed capacity. But as an anal retentive lawyer, it's going to make me feel a lot better when some of that stupid stuff is off the books. So if it's not really going to save us that much money, why do we care? Why do we care about overcriminalization, especially if we don't have the problem that they have other places? And this is where I'm going to differ a little bit from what Doug said. Look, Joe Sixpack ain't got nothing to worry about. He is not the guy who's getting uh, caught in this mens rea net. He's not. The examples we see, like um, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Evertson. I hadn't heard about him until Greg mentioned him in an article recently or an op-ed, so I researched him. Google his case, then go Google uh, sodium metal in water. Sodium metal in water. See, he was importing 10 metric tons of this stuff, which explodes when it touches water. And there are some really cool videos to see it. So I am a little sympathetic if the feds don't want that being sent on airplanes because it will bring an airplane down if it gets wet. And I'm uh, okay with them being concerned about what might happen to large stockpiles of that if it's not properly taken care of. Again, you know, whether or not he did take care of it properly or not is for those lawyers to uh, debate. And I'm not really going to defend the feds because I chose not to go work for them a long time ago and I'm glad I did. But again, it, what he was an entrepreneur, he's a businessman, and that is who this issue hits squarely in the pocketbook, okay? The Cook brothers got involved in criminal justice when they had to fork over something like $20 million to the feds because of alleged pollution at their refinery in Corpus Christi. So that is why this is getting the attention it is now. It's not grassroots, okay? It's from the top down because business feeling encroached upon by the government is going to do what they naturally do, okay? This is one of my favorite quotes from P.J. Rourke in Parliament of Horrors. If you haven't read that book, leave now and go read it. It was written 25 years ago, 30 years ago, still 
insightful, okay? But it's natural for business to get involved in legislating when legislators have been getting involved in business. It's just natural self-defense. And this is my last uh, segment to talk about my observations of what's going on in the feds. We've seen this great kumbaya mo moment between the left and the right, okay? Remember, politics, as I tell prosecutors all the time, politics is not a straight line. It's not left and right. It's a circle, okay? And on the right, libertarianism comes and meets and joins with the uh, ACLU types on the left. And so we've seen that in criminal justice. But one of the things that some of the Democrats and some of the lefties who've been in the criminal justice reform business for a long time are starting to realize is, well, yeah, I love having this help, but is it really why? Are you really helping us for the reasons that we think you are? I always keep this quote from J.P. Morgan, who knew something about money and about government. I always keep this quote in mind at the legislature. All right? Everybody's got a good reason for doing it. They also have a real reason for doing it. Okay, and I think some of this is starting to cause some doubts on the left. And so in Washington, where I see this mens rea reform talk, all of a sudden they're starting to snap to the fact that, whoa, whoa, whoa this isn't just going to help these people, that, these thugs that we want to hug. Okay, it's also going to help a lot of people that we really don't like. And so I'm curious to see if this might be the first cracks in that new honeymoon relationship that we've seen between the right and the left. Because the low-hanging fruit, a lot of it has been taken care of already. A lot of the things that have been passed didn't really have a whole lot of opposition. Now as the reform movement tries to go farther, you're going to find right and left not quite so lockstep anymore. And I think it's going to be interesting to watch. Well, that's the means to my end. Thank you for having me. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Shannon. Our next panelist is uh, Bill Kuntz. Bill Kuntz was appointed Executive Director of the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation in September 1999. The TDLR is the state's umbrella occupational licensing agency, regulating many diverse occupations and industries such as electricians, uh, elevators, boxing, and property tax professionals. Currently, there are 25 programs with over 683,000 licensees being regulated by the department. TDLR has been the recipient of the Quality Texas Foundation's Progress Level Awards for the agency's sound, balanced approach to organizational management and performance improvement. The employee engagement survey conducted by the Austin American Statesman has identified TDLR three times as one of the top 25 best mid-sized workplaces in Austin. Mr. Kuntz has over 40 years of public service experience. He previously served as a Deputy Securities Commissioner of the State Securities Board and the Executive Director of the Texas Real Estate Commission. Dr. Michael Lauderdale, the social, School of Social Work, uh, the University of Texas, studied his successful management of the Texas Real Estate Commission. Dr. Lauderdale's findings are published in, this, in his book, Reinventing Texas Government, and has a best practice uh, case study on the Social School Work website. Bill holds Bachelor of Science degrees from Louisiana State University in New Orleans, with a major in finance and a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of New Orleans. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Kuntz. Well, I'm here to talk about the administrative side of things and what do we do when somebody has a criminal conviction and comes to us to get a license. That's part of the process that we're working with. Uh, the concept that we have at TDLR is we're the Department of Licensing and Regulation. We're trying to put people to work to streamline the process and get people into the workforce as fast as possible. And people that come to us with criminal convictions do have a, a unique uh, challenge for us to work through on that. So the topics that I've got are the Occupations Code, just to give you an idea of what the Department of Licensing and Regulation is, how we are structured in our uh, functional business model, the criminal conviction guidelines and how we uh, work with those so that we are really a model on how to go about that in reviewing uh, convictions. And then finally, a, a real a small touch of smaller, smarter government, which is the reducing some of the uh, criminal conviction pr provisions that have been in the, uh, the statutes that we have. Chapter 51 is the overarching statute for uh, TDLR. That's in the Occupations Code. That is our umbrella statute. Uh, we are an umbrella agency, and, and under that umbrella, we currently have 25 statutes that we administer. 
the uh, Sunset Commission and the legislature this last session is sending 14 new programs to us, so we're going to expand quite a bit. Chapter 53 is the uh, criminal uh, convictions provision for all licensing agencies, and that's the uh, results of a criminal conviction. What happens with that? Our seven-member commission is appointed by the governor. Those commissioners cannot have an interest in any license or business that we regulate. So we have no conflict of interest in regulating the different license uh, programs that we have. We have 19 advisory boards that give us technical expertise about each of those different programs that require an advisory board. The 14 new programs come to us with 14 more advisory boards. So we're going to be busy having advisory board meetings. Uh, currently, as I said, we've got 25 TDLR programs. The seven member commission are my bosses, so I answer to them. They set the uh, policy, I administer the, uh, the, the uh, agency. Chapter 51 gives us the ability to look at the criminal history of an individual that's applying for a license. Additionally, we are able to look at the honesty, trustworthiness, and integrity of the individual. And a lot of what we see is when somebody with a criminal conviction comes through and they're, we're uh, reviewing that, the uh, demeanor that they have, the veracity that uh, the SOA judge sees, what our commissioners see, uh, really goes into that issue of honesty, trustworthiness, and integrity, because some of those things you've got to just uh, take a good hard look at it to make a decision. Chapter 53 has four different uh, provisions that, that we look at in whether we consider a criminal conviction. First is the nature and seriousness of the crime. Second, the relationship of the crime to the purpose of the license. Uh, for instance, if somebody's been convicted of stealing copper, uh, do they get a license as an elect uh, electrician where they're exposed to more copper that they could steal? Uh, third is the uh, opportunity to engage in further criminal activity, stealing additional copper. Or then finally, the relationship of the crime to the ability and capacity to, uh, or fitness to uh, perform those duties. So that those are uh, some of the things that are looked at when we evaluate that criminal conviction. Uh, chapter 53 of the Occupations Code requires that each agency come up with a criminal convictions guideline that says this conviction relates to this license and these are the reasons why. So that we have a rational basis for uh, looking at those particular criminal convictions. In addition to that, chapter 53 also allows us to look at deferred adjudication. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's defer deferred adjudication. I really wasn't convicted. It's been expunged. In certain instances, it's important to know about that, uh, that conviction, that crime that was committed. And what we found was that in issues where there were uh, sexual assault of a child, quite often the district attorney would uh, negotiate out deferred adjudication for injury to a child, which sanitizes what uh, it sounds like, and that uh, the child was not then put in the place of having to be traumatized by testifying again. The individuals that were being able to walk those of convictions and those crimes against children were getting deferred adjudication. Uh, our agency went to the legislature and worked with the legislature to get this added to Chapter 53 and Chapter 51 so that we would not have those types of individuals going into homes and putting the Texas uh, citizens in jeopardy. A quick run through of some of the uh, criminal conviction uh, ideas that we have that uh, protecting Texans for air conditioning and electricians, uh, prohibited sexual contact, uh, children as victims. You'll see that through most of those uh, different uh, uh, statutes that we have. Theft and burglary. Uh, homicide and kidnapping. The, the importance here is that the individuals that have an air conditioning license or electrician's license are going into your home. And do you want that individual that has that background going into your home and exposing you to that danger? In towing, the issue is not the, the same as the others. Uh, intoxication, uh, DWI, manslaughter, racketeering with the, taking the car and, and uh, taking your title and, and uh, selling that car. Those are issues that were important that were identified by the advisory board in order to come up with those uh, criminal conviction guidelines. Uh, and then cosmetology and barbering. We regulate both of those. They're separate statutes. And cosmetologists and barbers don't like each other. And to try to lump <laughs> them together is a very big mistake. But they do similar uh, job functions. They work on your hair. 
The issue is that in barbering, the advisory board said, we're concerned about the illegal manufacture and delivery of controlled substances, because in certain instances, barbershops were used as fronts for distribution of narcotics. And we saw that just down in Seguin, it's last November, uh, the Seguin police with the DEA busted the uh, Zeta cartel that uh, was trafficking uh, cocaine. There's some, uh, I think, 11 uh, kilos of cocaine that were seized, weapons and money, and they also uh, have closed down, uh, I think it's 13 barbershops because they were involved in that. So the advisory boards that we have giving input to our commissioners about what is important in their particular industries uh, provide what criminal convictions we should look at in order to uh, say this person should not get a license. And I think that's a good example of how there's some differences in those statutes. Well, we've got a, uh, the ability, thanks to uh, the 81st legislature, to give somebody an idea ahead of time, is the conviction that I have going to have an effect on the license that I'm going to apply for? Because quite often you have to take schooling, you have to pass a test in order to get the license. If you know ahead of time that this particular conviction that you have would be an impediment to licensing, it's nice to be able to apply for this uh, criminal conviction uh, letter that uh, we would look at that and say, your history of your convictions indicate that you would be able to get a license or that it would be doubtful that, uh, that you would, we would have to uh, work through those issues. Uh, it's been a very successful program because 1,600 uh, shells have been uh, re requested only 253 were found that would be an impediment to uh, individuals getting a license. So it's one of those things where it's really a good system. It gives somebody a heads up. It's $25 to apply for a CHELL license or a CHELL letter. Now, in 2012, right after we got the CHELL process going in, in 2010, we had a, a case that uh, hit the newspaper. We had a parolee that uh, was twice convicted of aggravated sexual assault. Uh, he applied for his license, and the uh, commission decided, no, we're not going to give a license to that individual, because at the time of committing the second aggravated sexual assault at gunpoint, he threatened the victim and said, if you tell anybody about this, I'm going to kill you. Uh, it was pretty telling testimony in his conviction. The commission saw that record from the, uh, the court. And they said, we're not going to give that license to the individual. He was applying for a barber's license. And the uh, criminal convictions for sexual assaults were something that the barber uh, board said that uh, they wanted us to take a look at. So we rejected that license. Well, we were vilified in the newspaper. It said, the state has giveth and the state has taketh away. Because the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services had funded that individual's training to become a barber. He had come out of uh, prison. They reached out and they were doing their job to try to get people mainstreamed and get them uh, employed. And they paid for his schooling. And But when he came to us and said, uh, we, uh, I want a license, you need to give it to me because the state's already spent this money on me. Our commission said no. So uh, we were in the media for that. And I was expecting questions about that during the next legislative session because I was ready with the Paul Harvey moment saying, let me tell you about the rest of the story. I'll kill you if you tell anybody about it. And it was his second chance that he committed that, uh, that crime. So it was one of those things we did not want to have that person licensed. What it did was it, it got DARS and TDLR together to come up with a, a streamlined process for DARS to submit for CHEL letters so that they can submit that and we can tell them ahead of time whether somebody that wants to be trained as a widget uh, manufacturer, I'm just use that for uh, uh, an example, and said, would their criminal background have an impact on that? And there again, out of the 99 shells that were requested by DARS since we've started this, only five have been found to be uh, impediments to somebody getting that license. So that process has worked. It was one of those things we had to get the headlines to get the two agencies together because we didn't know about each other and what we were doing. The criminal history results that we have, we have a lot of people that have criminal histories. Uh, in the electrician's uh, trade, we had about, four, in the uh, period that I was looking at, about 14% of the people that applied for an electrician's license had a criminal uh, history. Uh, 
when we look at those, those criminal histories don't necessarily do, uh, uh, keep them from getting that license. Our license division can look at that and say, no, we can go ahead and issue the license there. The license division has been able to issue 97% of the licenses within 10 days of the application because they were able to move through that pretty quickly. Of those that had, had a question, 3,000 uh, 3, or so sent to the enforcement division for further review. And after the enforcement division investigated and went through the vetting process for that, only 603 of those original applications were ultimately denied. That's less than two-tenths of 1%. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is uh, something that the convictions are not keeping people from getting licenses. We apply common sense to that so that we are able to uh, take care of it. Even when we deny a license, people have the abil ability to go to SOA uh, through that process and then go to district court if they need to, to uh, try to prove their, their uh, worth for a license. I'm gonna click through these real quickly to get to this other point. We spend a lot of time doing prison outreach. We go out to the prisons and tell them about the process, what they need to do in order to get a license in the 25 different statutes that we have so that they can spend their time productively uh, so that when they come out of prison, they'll be able to uh, get into a job that's gonna work for them. Uh, the last visit that we had at TDCJ in the Hondo unit, uh, the Torres unit in Hondo, uh, was videotaped by the Wyndham School so that they can show that at all the classes. Uh, this is the smaller, smarter government piece. And if you look at the red, in 2013, we took to the legislature a, a proposal to decriminalize eight of our statutes. And uh, we worked with Senator Corona for that. That worked very well. We identified that issue in our strategic planning process. Uh, that process is very robust. We have focus groups to identify those issues that need to be brought to the attention of the legislature. Uh, the T Texas Public Policy Foundation participated in our focus group for the 2014 uh, strategic plan. Vic Ricretti was one of the people that came to that, uh, that focus group. Uh, Vicar, I see you out there. Uh, it's one of those things where it's good to get that input so that we can have common sense regulation. Uh, the legislature is sending those other programs to us. And in closing, our uh, commission is independent. We want to make sure that we protect the, the health and safety of Texas citizens. We do a lot of outreach to help mainstream people coming out of prison so they can get a job. And we've been able to do that by lowering the cost. You're looking at the back side of that, that graph there, that those are the license costs that keep coming down. We have a history of reducing fees for our licensees because of the efficiencies that we have. And because of that, the legislature is sending new programs to us, most recently the health and safety uh, provisions from the Department of Health Safety. So thank you. Okay, I think we, uh, we may have time for one brief question um, that I'm gonna answer, ask, so uh, yeah, I apologize. Yeah. And all I can think about for the rest of the day now is barbers and cosmetologists coming together and some West Side Story type thing with a flamethrower hairspray thing and some big thing of shears, so <laughs> thank you for that, yeah. Um, just kind of going down the line here in about a, under a minute or so, um, Representative Krauss discussed uh, HB 1396, which was included the commission to study all the uh, non-penal code um, criminal laws that we have on the books right now. Uh, and just briefly, I'd like to know what you all, if you can make a recommendation to the commission when it becomes full at this point, um, what would be your initial recommendation to want to come out of that? Well, I, I just want to make sure we come out with a more efficient criminal justice system. I, I think there's so many laws out there, we don't know what they are. Uh, for the most part, I think you're right. The people who are susceptible to being caught by many of the three felonies a day aren't, aren't Joe Sixpack, but the fact that there are laws out there for which they could be penalized or incarcerated for, I think should make us all have a little bit of pause. So uh, I'm looking at the commission to do a, a lot of due diligence to come back to us with a recommendation at the beginning of the 85th session, say, here's what we found, and uh, Lord willing, we we will uh, take uh, immediate action on those and uh, create a more efficient, effective criminal justice system, continuing to uh, put away the people we need to put away, but not those uh, we don't need to. So that's pretty much it. Same question? Yeah, same okay. question. I, I would just say that, 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 you know, what we need to get to is a, uh, I think we have a great criminal justice system 
uh, relatively speaking, to the rest of the United States. And I think Shannon and I got to, to deal with, uh, you know, when we went through and, and worked on this uh, Second Chances bill with a, a lot of the, uh, you know, went down and met with a lot of the, the uh, uh, district attorneys in different, uh, the major cities, and then we set up some meetings at their offices. And, you know, the, the, they're not power-hungry people. They're people who are use common sense. And, you know, they don't want to put anybody in jail any more than any, any of us want people to go to jail. So I think Texas really is a model that we need to, as Shannon said earlier, you know, at the federal level, they're trying to copy us. So I think at the end of the day, all we're looking for, and I think that our, our legislators are looking for, is just common sense, you know, and, and you can go through any level of, of laws and at, at municipal, state, federal, and, and get rid of 20 or 30 percent probably, and, and you know, no one's left harmed. So it'd make, frankly, Shannon and his team's job easier. Shannon? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of this commission is a good one. Um, it's something that Mark Levin has been talking about for a long time. He deserves a lot of the credit for getting that idea some, some legs. So it found purchase at the legislature and then got passed, which is great. Um, Taking off, I agree with a lot of what Doug said. We don't need to have laws on the books that aren't getting prosecuted to begin with. Why, you know, a lot of these things, they were passed and pro maybe no one's ever been prosecuted for them. And that doesn't make any sense from a limited government perspective. But when I put my, my legislative kind of lobbying hat on, the challenges will be figuring out, first of all, why was it put on the books in the first place? Okay, Chesterton's fence, right? It's like, before you can take a fence down, I'm going to make you tell me why it was put up, and then we can decide if it's a good idea. Because, you know, I've heard talk about um, oyster crimes. Well, you know who's using the oyster statutes right now? The Department of Public Safety in the Rio Grande, okay? We have a bunch of people who are actually crossing international borders because they're illegally harvesting oysters, and those folks that we're paying to go down there are using that as a way, as a reason to intercept some of those folks and make sure they're not doing anything worse. Uh, another thing to talk about is, you know, thrashing pecans is a crime because pecan is the state nut or something. Um, but that penalty may actually, that offense may actually lower the penalty for what would otherwise be theft if you just were going to charge somebody with stealing. So there may be some unintended consequences if people just take a knee-jerk reaction to some of this. So they need to look at why it was put on the books, first of all. The second thing is who put it there, all right? Let's be realistic. If a legislator spent a lot of political capital getting something put on the books for a constituent and now, four years later, you want to take it off, you're going to have to do some persuading. And this group is going to have to um, be able to explain why it needs to be taken off the books. Fortunately, many of these crimes were already against the law under some other offense. The legislature would just make them more against the law than they already were because some constituent wanted it. And so being able to show that this conduct may be prosecutable other ways under existing statutes in the penal code instead of the occupations code will be helpful. And then the last thing and the biggest problem that I foresee is not letting it be a Christmas tree. And you know what that means, but for those of you who don't, when bills get to the House floor or the Senate floor that touch a broad topic, it becomes a vehicle for people's failed bills to be amended onto. And then all of a sudden you have a bill that may have come from this committee and had agreed, here's 500 crimes that we're going to get rid of. But what if somebody wants to get rid of uh, the crime of possession of controlled substances, okay? And they amend that onto there. That kills that bill. And we've seen a little bit of this in Washington where it's almost a tangential issue that's pulling down some of this mens rea reform in a way because you have to be able to have a product that stays clean is the phrase we use in the legislature. And that is a huge challenge for whoever takes that up. So. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mr. Coons, in a, yeah, about 30 seconds or so, I think, uh, yeah, yeah very the gentleman quickly. did not yield his time uh, prior. I, I think that the, the process that we went through in, in 2013 to look at our statutes and say which statutes had a criminal provision in it, and we're administrative, and the criminal provisions there were not being used. It was just excess baggage that was there. 
But the thing that we have to pay attention to as an uh, administrative agency is the legislative wisdom and which legislator thought that it was important to put that in there, and we need to go to talk to that individual if they were the sponsor of that bill that put that piece in, because we need to understand why it was done and whether that was just uh, something that just got added on without uh, really a, a lot of reason. And that, if that's the case in talking through the, that issue with the legislator, that uh, that can be taken out. But the things that we found in these uh, eight statutes that we uh, ap appealed uh, was that those provisions were not being used. They were not being referred to the DA. If they had been referred to the DA, they have a lot of rapes and murders that they're taking care of and some administrative penalty uh, that uh, has a criminal provision to it. They weren't going to be interested in that. So uh, it was an easy no-brainer for us to say, let's clean things up, and we just don't have that excess baggage in the statute. Well, thank you all for uh, attending here. Uh, we have two more criminal justice panels uh, throughout the week, uh, one on Thursday and one on Friday on policing and corrections. So, uh